one of the big, you know, rubs that people have and where the Web3 culture is going is sort of decentralization, disintermediation of these platforms, direct ownership, connection of creators with their consumers, their fan bases directly to earn money. everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm so excited to have my next guest here. She is a friend, and she is the founder and co-CEO of one of my favorite Bay Area companies called Minted, Miriam Nafisi. Uh, and she is, like I said, this incredible, incredible leader uh, who started this company, Minted, around actually a couple of years after uh, the company I founded, Hint. And so we We've been a, been crossing in a lot of different uh, circles together, and uh, we were both just talking about YPO as well. And uh, she's just absolutely amazing. So prior to starting Minted, uh, Miriam, we're going to get you to talk a little bit more about this. But you had actually started another uh, company called Eve, um, and and you sold that company. I read before you were thirty years old. I mean, just an absolutely incredible. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about how Minted has over fifteen thousand artists as part of its platform, and uh, definitely. Um, really excited to hear that you've got it based in over 100 countries um, from where all of these artists are and all of the stuff that you're doing with different partnerships where um, I, I just have absolutely loved watching Minted grow to where it is today. So welcome, Miriam. Thank you. So great to be here. Thank you. So you and I were both part of the San Francisco Business Times uh, 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 dinner that we got to go to for uh, Bay Area women, actually Bay, Bay Area leaders. So most inspiring leaders um, at the end of last year, we got to sit down and actually have a little bit of dinner with our husbands and, and children, which was really, really nice. Uh, so I got to also meet your parents and I, I love, so tell me and tell everybody a little bit about your interesting childhood growing up. Sure, sure. I have great parents. I'm very lucky. Um, my mom was born in Shanghai and my dad was born in Tehran, Iran, and they met at Georgetown undergrad. So they're like a, we're a made in America combo because everybody asks how on earth these two people meet. And of course it's the U.S. That's how they, everybody meets, I guess. And so we, um, we went overseas and I grew up overseas because my dad was a development economist. Um, specializing in agricultural development, really trying to help bring farming techniques to farmers all over the world. He's very much a guy made from the 60s, cut from the 60s cloth, really wanting to improve our world. And um, so we went all, all over, you know, Kuwait, Lebanon, Tanzania, um, and then eventually Iran, actually, uh, we were there during the revolution and left right after the revolution. And then Egypt, um, we were in Egypt until I was in uh, through ninth grade. And then I finally came back to the U.S. We were, we were always in American schools overseas, but um, I got to meet some really interesting people. As you can imagine, it was uh, really international. It's kind of an international melting pot. Um, and, um, it, you know, I would meet Americans from every part of the U.S. in in the American schools. So my best friends in Egypt were from um, military bases all over the U.S., like from North Dakota to South Carolina, everywhere, Texas. And I also met Egyptians in my school. So it was like a really fascinating, it was a very fascinating way to grow up. And I saw a lot of, I saw everything from, um, you know, the local poverty to, you know, social dynamics to, and, and, and I think where I came away with was the, there are a lot of commonalities between people in terms of their driving forces. Um, really is, I guess my big, one of my biggest takeaways is that you could read people's body language after a while. If you, if you didn't understand the language, I would get used to watching people and trying to understand what was going on. And I had to really be, I think one other thing I learned was how to, how to fit in no matter who I was talking to or where I was. So it's a kind of a bit of a chameleon training. 
Well, and being able to read people and uh, definitely great training to becoming an entrepreneur and understanding your consumer, understanding, being able to be a leader uh, and hire people, hire a great team, but also manage a great team. So which you've been so inspiring uh, watching you do that, all of that. So where do you think this entrepreneurship bug came from? Honestly, I didn't really realize I could be an entrepreneur until after I landed in the Bay Area after um, college. I, 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 nobody in my family was in business at all. I didn't even think about business as an occupation um, because my dad was an economist. My mom was a writer. And um, when I got to the Bay Area in 1993, following a boyfriend out here who became my husband, <laughs> um, I got here and realized what was happening and fell in love with the consumer internet as a user. So I pulled up my AOL, like got my AOL dial up account. I went to Amazon and I thought, this is the absolute coolest thing that I can click on these links and buy books and have them shipped to me. I just really fell in love with, with that first, the technology, the experience of e-commerce first. And then, um, I'd also just seen a lot of companies through banking and consulting as, as, cause they were my clients. That was what I did after school. And I realized that um, I thought it might be not in my personality to work for a long time, working up my way up up a corporate ladder. I thought that perhaps I wouldn't be given the responsibilities that I thought perhaps I could take on earlier. It would be a long road to getting responsibility. And there was an element of me that thought, you know, maybe as a woman and maybe as a minority woman, that it would might be a bit more difficult in corporate America to, to, to work my way up that ladder. If I were an entrepreneur, it's a little bit more anonymous. I thought I could create a product. And if they liked, if people liked it, they would just buy it. They probably wouldn't care too much about who was behind the scenes. So I thought that it would maybe be more meritocratic to start a company. And if I was succeeded, I succeeded. If I didn't, I didn't. It was all on me. You know, so that's kind of where the, how the thought, how my thinking was going at the time. So your first entrepreneurial, where you hung your shingle, talk to us about that first company. Yeah. So the first company, I was a second year student at the business school and I decided not to interview with any companies for a job upon graduation. And I had this friend who had worked in, who had been my roommate in New York when we were both working in investment banking in New York. And I really loved this friend, Varsha. She was smart. She had a really high work ethic. And I thought, this is the person I really want to start a company with, but she's at McKinsey now and married in New York. So now I've got to convince her to leave her husband behind, leave McKinsey, (laughs) leave New York and come to California. So I had my first job as an entrepreneur was just to call her up and say, let's start a company together. There's a lot of funding available. There's tons of funding available. We've got to do something in, in the space and in the internet. And she, um, she said, okay, but only if we do this company I like, which is this, uh, cosmetics company online. So I said, fine, that's great. Let's do the, let's do your, let's, let's follow your idea because I don't really care. It's okay. Like I want to pick the, I want to pick the person I want to work with. And this cosmetics idea looks good enough. Um, I, maybe I use cosmetics, maybe I can figure this out. (laughs) And so we were really pretty young, but we raised $26 million to start this company called Eve.com, which was the first cosmetics company online. And we had to go convince like Chanel and huge like luxury brands to take their goods and put them on the internet for the very first time. And they would, they, you know, we'd go into these meetings and they would say, you know, are you guys gray market? Like, you know, you're going to sell off to the, the, the biggest fear of the luxury brands is you're going to sell their goods off the back of a truck. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you had to really sell. So we're like, you know, 26, basically trying to sell big luxury brands on moving onto the internet for the first time. That was my first experience. <laughs> and we ended up selling the company about uh, two weeks before the NASDAQ plunged. We sold the company for cash. Like literally in April, 2000, we closed the deal and, um, two weeks later, the whole market fell apart and started just imploding. That's my story. That's incredible. What do you think was the biggest lesson you learned in building that first company that you still think about today in building your company? One of the things that I really remember is that we started and then venture capital firms backed five more competitors to launch into the business right after us. And so we had a ton of competition and most people would think, geez, this is really difficult. You know, like Mm -hmm. I I felt like at the end of the day, if we kept our focus, really kept our heads down, we could 
maintain a lead and to not get too distracted looking over our shoulder at the competitors. That was one big lesson is not to constantly be looking at your competitors, but really thinking about focusing on your own business. It's, it's healthy to look and understand the competition, but to become obsessed with it and always look over your shoulder or always start to sort of um, move in their direction is not, I think is not healthy. So we were able to get ahead actually, even though we had a very slim lead, um, we built it to like 10 million in the first year in sales, which was I think pretty good. And 2 million uniques a month in 99, which was a pretty big, a pretty big number. Um, the, um, I guess the other one I'd learned, the other lesson I learned was when we did our kind of classical five forces, Michael Porter analysis, like, is this a good business to start or not? One of the big problems was that it looked pretty concentrated. The Estee Lauder companies owned over 50% of the cosmetics market. And mm -hmm. if you followed the rules of the Michael Porter analysis, you'd say, don't start this business. Mm -hmm. It's a bad business. Cause like there's too much concentration on the supply side. Well, we went forward anyway, and I was nervous about it, but it turned out that there were all these little cosmetics brands like, um, um, Lush or, or, or NARS or, uh, benefit that really needed distribution and were getting shut out of the department store. So the department store sales were not really reflective of what could have been. So it was almost that the data was wrong. You know, that once you put all these little brands on the internet, they started selling like crazy. Totally. If you couldn't get a counter space at Macy's, you were not that big, right? I mean, that was right. kind and of And you had to pay a lot of money for that counter space. So as a little brand, it was really hard to break in. So of course their sales weren't reflected because they weren't able to sell through the channel. You know, the channel was blocking them. So it turned out the big, one of the big lessons there is like what looks small in the real world. If you aggregate all of the demand online for something that is quote unquote small, you actually can build a pretty nice, a bit, pretty big business on the internet. Something that looks small can actually be pretty big. Minted was like that too, and which we can talk about, but so that was another big lesson. Yeah. So after selling Eve, you went on to create Minted and mm -hmm. was this more in line with kind of what you were most interested in and obviously really focused on the, you know, the crowdsource design marketplace concept, which I can only imagine you trying to get <laughs> people to really understand it. I mean, I, you know, you talk about a visionary entrepreneur and I just, I, I thought a lot about that whole concept when I was doing some research on you and I just thought, wow, I mean, can you imagine like you walking into those first meetings saying, okay, crowdsource. And they were like, huh, yeah. Or, what? <laughs> <I mean. laughs> yeah, it was very difficult, especially because I was crowdsourcing design for stationary products and talking to male investors, you know, it was very, it was very, you know, and I was, I was saying, no, 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 the design really could be, and should be a lot better, but there's a, it's very hard to quantify that right to a financially minded investor. What does that mean? The design needs to be better. It's very hard to explain that. Um, you know, it's very hard to actually explain what better design looks like when you're talking, you have to almost show people. So you could picture it's the, the challenge is picturing it in my head, but not being able to explain it to people. So it was significantly harder to, to raise capital for Minted than it had been for Eve. Eve was a very simple concept. You stick all the makeup in a warehouse and you just ship it. Right. And even then people were like, no one's going to buy cosmetics online, Mariam, you know, like it's just not going to happen. People need to try it on. It's not happening. This is a bad idea. With Minted, it was, I don't understand this crowdsourcing thing. What is this design competition? And stationary, no one's going to buy that online either. So it was, it was very, very, it was a, I think it would be, I would call it an uphill battle to raise capital for Minted at the beginning. Um, but um, also we were, we raised right before the recession. I think like maybe four weeks afterwards, Lehman Brothers failed right after we had raised our first round. So we had to make that money work for a long, long time. Um, but the, um, there with minted, I was just captivated with, I, I mean, I do love great design and I was one of those people who would go into a stationary store and touch the paper all the time. Like the really nice cotton, cottony paper with a letterpress, like really beautiful imprint. So it's a little bit of a paper nerd to begin with. Then, so that, I think it was fundamentally more interesting to me that I could empower talent potentially that was hidden out there all over the world. Like my, my mom's side of the family are all graphic designers and artists. And, um, I was thinking about them, you know, like my experiences talking to them about what, what their experiences have been like. And, um, 
fundamentally was more interested in that than in cosmetics, for example. You, cosmetics was great, but this was a, a chance to really, you know, find follow independent people and yeah. follow my passion. Exactly. Follow my passion for design and for working with creative people that I, re- I really enjoy working with um, creative people and helping them navigate the world of business, I guess, is, is something I enjoy. So interesting. So I read somewhere that you mentioned that the intersection of the rise of social media and the recession created the perfect window to start Mm -hmm. Minted. So what do you think about today? You know, there's web 3.0 as such a Mm -hmm. buzzy topic. I mean, do you think we're seeing these windows right now that are forming that are kind of the perfect storm to go and start new businesses? Uh, and uh, you know, yes, I'd love to hear your perspective. Yes, as someone who surfed the web, the wave of Web One and then Web Two. Web One was Eve.com, Web Two was Minted, and Web Three for me is a venture studio that I've just started called Heretic Ventures that I'm running on the side of of Minted, and that is. 100% focused on the creator economy with a strong tie to foundation and web three, meaning um, the ideas of decentralization, uh, the idea that decision-making will become more and more decentralized, the idea of equity and fairness um, for artists and creators of all kinds. Um, the idea that, f- for example, we all, we all search on Google right now, right? If we search on Google, um, that turns into data that actually accrues to Google, right? That, that, that becomes data that Google, Google can use. It's not something that we are paid for as for our search, you know, for, for searching, or let's say you post an image on, on Instagram to share with your friends. There is something you're doing there that is creating, you're creating, but you're not necessarily so that, so the, so the uh, argument goes in web three, this is the argument that the platforms are taking and they're, they're getting a lot of information about you and they're growing, but the people contributing are not actually earning. So that's the, one of the big, you know, rubs that people have and where, where the web three, you know, web three culture is going is sort of decentralization, disintermediation of these platforms, uh, direct ownership, uh, connection of creators with their consumers, their fan bases directly to earn money. Um, and then crypto, or let's say, um, you've heard everyone talks about NFTs. Well, what's the big benefit of an NFT? Well, I sort of see it as a, um, uh, ownership, a set of like a, a way to, a way to create ownership in things like music or in writing or in any kind of, any kind of creative content product that can then be, um, fractionalized or shared between people and can create a, a, um, payment system or ownership structure that charges up or turbocharges any community. Cause you can imagine if you can imagine if, um, shoppers on, um, and buyers on a market, on a, on a current marketplace were actually rewarded over time by buying and selling on a platform that they actually earn a little bit of the company. Well, NFTs and all that stuff that has arisen around the blockchain gives companies a chance to actually give give away bits of ownership to anyone who participates in the community, thereby hopefully giving, you know, turbocharging the activity in that community because you have a whole incentive structure you can build. So that is, to me, very exciting. Um, And so that's why I've got this happening in Web3. And so what are you doing with this company then? This is a company that produces companies. So we have a venture studio where we have, awesome. where we are circling around certain themes and launching companies with CEOs out of the studio. So we Stop. are, um, we are hiring into the studio right now. Um, so please check us out, heretic.ventures. Um, but uh, we, um, we, uh, we are going to be a, a core team at, a st- at the studio that puts puts businesses out, finds a CEO for those businesses and then launches them. And then they, the, the, we will seed those businesses with some starting capital. And then of course those businesses graduate and then they have their own lives. So it's a lot of babies flying the nest. Let's put it that a lot of like baby companies flying the nest, which is what I enjoy the zero to one phase. That's what I was just going to say. So is that, (laughs) I always talk to entrepreneurs about, uh, 
kind of what is the phase that they really like the most. You love that early, early um, stage. I mean, I think you've definitely proven that you can do more than that and and grow mm-hmm. companies. But I mm-hmm. also like the really early um, stage and the creating and the building. I, I view you definitely as an incredible builder. Would you agree that that's your favorite? Yeah, I like this. I like this, like looking at this blank sheet of paper and, and thinking of something new and really figuring out how to design it in a way that it has the best DNA so that it, it, it's a really self-propelling, self-perpetuating vehicle. So I, I really like the company business model design phase, um, and then breaking it through into getting some traction for the business. Um, it is really a scary part of business. (laughs) I would say sometimes you, like you really have to combat your fear all the time. It's something where you have to talk yourself into a state of like calm a lot. It's just, it's just one of, it's scary and also fun. It's fun because small teams, small groups of people, very, very curated groups of people you get to work with. Cause it's like, um, you know, you, you're not managing teams of a thousand, you're, you're cherry picking a couple people to start with. And that's really fun. Um, and of course you get to redesign from a nice clean slate, which is beautiful. Um, on the other hand, it can be very scary, right? Cause you're not yeah. sure if it's going to work. You're trying to sell people on this crazy, these crazy dreams, selling cosmetics online, some of like nuts, you know, and totally. same with <laughs> crowdsourcing sounded nuts. So I just have to keep reminding myself, everything I think I've done so far, people have said, it's just not going to work. Yeah. You know. But yeah. but then it does. So I, I love that. That's great. So you expanded from stationary to mm-hmm. home decor. Um you and had, art, yeah. Mm-hmm. And art. And uh so when do you decide to do that? When do you decide to go into new categories? And uh, for any founders yeah. who are out there starting to think about expansion, I mean, what like how do you make those decisions? It's a great question because I think <clears throat> we could have gone and just st- stuck with stationary and built a certain size business within the stationary total addressable market. And that size of business might be, let's say, a $10 billion market in the US. Um, and then we could build it to a certain size and sell it for a certain amount. Or there was a fork in the road that said, we can go raise more capital. We've realized that the community is actually not stationary designers that we form. There are all kinds of people in the community that are actually have day jobs that are not creative. And on top of that, there are artists. So what we've done is actually build a community that could be pointed at different things. We're going to go raise venture capital. And then what we've got to do is um, create a broader design marketplace and go for a bigger TAM, total addressable market, and a different outsize outcome. So I think it's right sizing the capital you took in to the kind of outcome, like the exit value you're trying to sell the company for or take it public and I guess I would say to your listeners, like if you're like, it it really is about thinking about um, how much capital you want to raise and what, and whether that makes sense in light of the total market and what your exit opportunity might be in terms of the value of the business. And that's kind of the decision we faced. And we decided to take the fork in the road. That was the, let's go into a bigger, broader design marketplace and leverage the talents of all these people in different ways and build a bigger community. Tell me a story in building Minted where you faced a huge challenge, something that was super unexpected, um, or there was a big loss. And what lessons did you learn and take away from that? Okay, so the, the one that really jumps out is that a big company wanted to buy us. And so what they decided to do was surprise attack and buy 100% buy the printer that served us, that did half of our volume. And to tell us that about two weeks before the Christmas season and then force us to sell. (laughs) And so um, they called me, the CEO called me on my cell phone, said, hey, you know, I really want you to see this. I don't want you to see the news first, but we bought X printer and the news is coming out tomorrow. And they And he knew full well, of course, that it was a 50, that they served us, that they did more than 50% of our volume. And it was October, you know, and you can't in this business go sign up a printer and integrate, do the API integration very well and scale for the holidays with quality and precision because we're a make on demand business at peak. It's very difficult, actually. 
Um, it's hard to do that right before the holiday season. Even if people want your business, they don't want you to do that in October. <laughs> and so, um, that was rough. And so then it turned out when I went in to talk to him that he was like, I want to, I want to buy this business. And I had to, um, bluff a little bit and run around and try to find another printer really fast and integrate. And, and sure enough, they pulled the rug out from under us after they figured out that we were looking for another printer and we were just out on the street cold, like after, you know, with like, it was just really bad. But it's a lesson of always having options though, too. Absolutely. Right? So first you have to like, make sure that you don't have a single point of failure or even like that 50, 50 was too high. It was left as vulnerable for attack. We had to be more spread out in terms of our printer base. Who knew that people would want to buy the company so badly that they would do something like that? I mean, it was just, we hadn't conceived of that, but it can happen. Listeners out there, it can happen to you. So I would say, you know, protecting yourself from attack like that. Um, and then just, um, I, I guess I would say, um, we just weren't ready to sell. We felt like we had more growth. We, we have had much, much more growth since that moment and we had conviction. So we stuck with our conviction and we, um, and we decided not to panic <laughs> and we, you know, we all pushed through it together. My great, great, great engineering team and fulfillment team pull, pulled together and they, they still call it printer get in at the company. Um, and there's still <laughs> some of the, some of the people are still there after this is like eight years later. Um, people are still there. So they still talk about printer get in, but, um, I would say just like pushing through a really bad competitive attack. Um, and I guess I am a little bit, as a result of it, uh, interested sometimes in antitrust because I feel like a big company should not be able to like crush little, little upstarts like us, like that suddenly. Um, so I, it has made me more interested in that, in that area. Super interested. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it, this happened in the beverage industry. I remember uh, one of the coconut water companies had a very similar situation where if somebody went and bought up all the coconut uh, farms in this one area that they were supplying oh from. God. And we didn't have any coconuts, uh, water, so it wasn't our issue. But I remember watching this whole thing happen and really thinking about the antitrust aspect mm -hmm. of it and, uh, and how you can... Um, how can how can you stop it in another country as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole yeah, that's other really tough. topic. So, well, that yeah. is um, amazing, amazing... It, advice and a great story to learn from. So tell me and the listeners how we can follow you and all your progress. Sure. I'm reachable at, uh, on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at M Nafisi, just my first initial last name. And you can also see, go to minted.com or heretic.ventures. Very, very yeah. cool. Well, we'll have all of that in the notes as well. But thank you so much, Miriam, for taking the thank time you. to sit down thank and you, talk with us. And you're such an incredible example of a great founder, a great entrepreneur, a great CEO mm -hmm. and leader. So I uh, really appreciate everything that you've shared with us today. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode. Please subscribe to The Kara Golden Show uh, so that you get to hear amazing people like Miriam. And please be sure to send in those five-star ratings. It really, really makes a difference in the algorithm. And find me on all social channels at Kara Golden. Uh, don't forget to pick up a copy of my book, Undaunted, if you have not had a chance to read it. And we're here every Monday and Wednesday. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Have an excellent rest of the week. And thanks again, Miriam, for your time. Thanks for having me.